Okay, so um, why have we been talking about options? Well, first of all, options are important uh, in and of themselves, but uh, when we think about corporate finance, we can also think a couple, about a couple of things in terms of options. And so first we're going to talk about equity and, in fact, levered equity. It's not just plain old equity, but it has to be levered equity. What do we mean by levered equity? What has to be in the capital structure in order for your equity to be levered, Ms. Black? Yeah, yeah you got to have debt in the capital structure in order for your equity to be levered. And so we say that the underlying asset is that at the assets of the firm, the underlying assets. So remember when we talked about call options, put options on stock, the underlying asset were the shares of stock. I told you we could have a call option on a piece of land. I told you about my friend that was on the school board and they were thinking about buying this piece of land. They bought the call option on the land. The land was the underlying asset there. Here, the underlying assets are the assets of the firm. And the strike price is the payoff of the bond. And so I've got this bond in a bond issue. And let's say that at the maturity date, which by the way is going to be the expiry or expiry for this option, the maturity date is the expiry for this option. On that date, I have to pay, let's say I've got a face value of a million dollars. So I got to pay that last little coupon. We won't even worry about that. Let's talk about that face value. That's what I've got to pay off. That's the strike price for this call option. So when would that call option be valuable? Well, if the assets are worth more than the face value of the debt at the end, which is the maturity date, then I exercise that call option by paying off the debt. This is the equity holders. The equity holders will exercise the call option by paying off the debt. And it's just like when you exercise a call option on, a, on stock, you end up paying the exercise price. Well, here the exercise price is the face value of that debt. Okay, now let's see. Uh, da -da -da -da. And so if the assets are worth more than the face value of the debt, then we say that the uh, equity of the shareholders have an in the money call. Remember, call options are in the money when the share price is higher than the uh, exercise price. In this case, when the value of the firm is higher than the value of the debt, then we have an in the money call option that is owned by the shareholders. Okay, now this is all sounds good so far until we realize that sometimes the assets aren't worth the money that is owed at the end. <coughs> And so what do the shareholders do at that point? They allow that call option to expire unexercised. What do we mean? They don't pay off the debt. They don't pay off the debt. Now, at that point, remember if I've got a call option that's unexercised, at the end, if it's a covered call, I still own the stock if I sold that option. Well, in this case, the debt holders wind up owning the company. The debt holders wind up owning the company if the shareholders don't exercise the option. Let me say that one more time. The debt holders wind up in, end up owning the company if the shareholders don't exercise the option. And so when we get down to the end of this thing, and remember we've got a million dollars in debt, if the company's only worth 900,000, I would be insane to pay off that debt for a million dollars when the company's only worth 900,000. I can just walk away and I let the debt holders hang on to, or to take over the company. Now, the debt holders, are they gonna be pleased? No, they're gonna be upset. Uh, they're only getting, uh, they could turn around and sell the assets for $900,000, they are going to be down $100,000. And so in this case, it's the shareholders that are the holders or buyers of the option, and it is the lender that is the 
issuer or writer or seller of the option. Let's say seller or writer of the option. The debt holders are the seller or writer of the option. Okay, so what's the, the technical name for this? It's called bankruptcy, right? If the shareholders allow this option to expire, then basically they have declared bankruptcy. Questions? Okay, now there's another way to think about this, and that is to think of levered equity as a put option. So the underlying assets, once again, compose the assets of, or the other assets of the firm, and the strike price is once again the payoff of the bond. So if at the maturity, the assets are worth less than the debt, the shareholders have an in the money put. And they're basically going to force the bondholders to buy the firm for the amount of the debt. But here's the trick. The money doesn't change hands at maturity or at the expiry. It's already changed hands. When did they get the money from the debt holders? Or from the debt issuers? Sorry, the debt holders. When did they get the money from the lenders? Way back when, right? When they borrowed the money. And so they can force, they're basically forcing the lender to buy the assets for the amount of money that they loaned to them. But that payment was made long, long ago. Now, you can think of it either way. But, uh, and, and, and it runs the same from there. But, and so it doesn't really matter which way you think of it because it, it's, uh, it, the same thing is going to happen both ways. And that is, if the underlying assets of the firm are more volatile, the put option and the call option both, if according to Black-Scholes, what happens to the value of those options as the volatility gets greater? They get greater as well. Yeah, they get greater as well. And so when you, uh, when you buy or when you lend money to someone, the, the option that's created that is more valuable the more volatile their assets are. And you can see that if you were doing something extraordinarily risky, you would love to do it on borrowed money because if it paid off, you get to keep the gains from it. And if it takes a big nosedive, then uh, they're stuck. You, you don't take the big loss, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so let's, we'll, let's walk through some corporate decisions that are impacted by this. And there are two um, corporate decisions that we talk about here. Number one is capital budgeting, and number two is mergers and diversification. And for some weird reason, I have swapped them in the order of discussion, so don't freak out about that. We're going to talk about the mergers and diversification first, and then we'll talk about capital budgeting. So, um, a lot of times, we talked about this in Chapter 21, a lot of times you will hear the CEO say, oh, we're doing this merger for purposes of diversification. And I told you that that was a bad reason for mergers. Do you remember why it was a bad reason for mergers? Because they can decrease the value of an asset or therefore like a put or call option. Okay, we'll get to that. There are better ways to diversify. Yeah, there are better ways to diversify. For instance, I can go out there and just buy the S&P 500 ETF, SPY, and I've instantly got a diversified portfolio of 500 stocks and that's very, very cheap compared to someone trying to diversify a company, which by the way, those merger transaction costs are in the millions, if not billions, right? And so we said diversification is a crappy rationale. And now we get to what you're mentioning, and that is the diversification in reduces risk. And when you do reduce the risk or underlying uh, volatility of the underlying assets, then that reduces the volatility of the stock that reduces the um, option value. And so this decrease in volatility due to diversification, and remember, when we diversify, we're taking two maybe crazy things, and when we combine them, now we've got something smooth. We've reduced that volatility, and therefore we have reduced 
the value of the option of that levered equity. And so you would actually see destruction of shareholder wealth by undertaking one of these diversif diversified, diversifying um, mergers. Only true, though, if it is levered equity, because remember, unlevered equity is not an option. Unlevered equity is not an option. And so if you've got levered equity and you undertake a diversifying merger or acquisition, it is going to destroy value from the standpoint that the option value is going to drop because the volatility drops. Okay. Now, I just mentioned the first bullet point under assumed diversification. And the second one says, since risky uh, debt can be viewed as a risky debt, risk-free debt minus a put option, what happens to the value of the risky debt? So we got our risk-free debt and minus that put option value. Well, the put option value becomes greater the more volatile it is. And so that premium on that uh, put option would be greater the more volatile. And so the value of the debt actually increases if they undertake one of, her, one of these diversifying uh, acquisitions or mergers. And the reason that is, is after the diversifying merger or acquisition, then the uh, put option, so the underlying assets are less volatile, so the put option loses value, and when you're subtracting a smaller number, that means that the debt is worth more. And it makes all the sense in the world if I loan money to a risky operation, I'm going to charge them a pretty high rate of interest, and then they go out and do something that diversifies that company. What's going to happen to the required yield of maturity on that debt? That's going to go down, right? What's going to happen to the value of that debt? Remember, yield of maturity and value are teeter-totter, right? And so if the yield of maturity goes down, the value goes up. So we can look at this from two different perspectives and see that these diversifying mergers and acquisitions actually benefit the debt holders. They actually benefit the debt holders at the expense of the shareholders. Let me say that again. We are, when we undertake a merger that diversifies the underlying assets and we have levered equity, we are basically transferring wealth from the shareholders to the debt holders. If you're a debt holder in a risky firm, would you like for them to diversify? Absolutely you would. Absolutely you would. Okay, now, knowing that, what's the goal of financial management? Maximize shareholder wealth. If we undertake one of these diversifying mergers with levered equity, are we maximizing shareholder wealth? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay, so we've already talked about the transfer of wealth. Um, we talked about the second point. Yeah, we talked about the third point. Any questions on this slide? So, can you go back? Sure. And can you say one more time to put options? Got to be more. Okay. Remember that both call options and put options, the value is higher when it's more volatile, uh -huh. and it's uh, lower when it's less volatile. Okay, we can actually model risky debt as risk-free debt uh -huh. minus a put option. Uh -huh. And we talked about the put option that debt represents. Okay, so if that uh, if the underlying asset becomes less risky, then the value of the put option goes down. Now I'm subtracting a smaller number from this risk-free debt amount. And if you subtract a smaller number, you get a bigger difference. Or, yeah, bigger number. You get, if you subtract a smaller number, you get a bigger number. Mm -hmm. that and that sense? means like debt is more expensive? Okay, yeah, so the debt's worth more. The value of the debt goes up. Yeah, so the value of the debt goes up. It's just like for an example where we, uh, if the risk of the underlying firm goes down, 
then the yield to maturity goes required goes down. What happens to the value of the bonds? You say they go up, right? Yeah. That's straight from chapter five. Yeah. So sorry, building off of what you're just saying, that's the reason why you can only have levered debt in this. Yeah, if you don't have leverage, there's no optionality involved in here because there's nobody to put the firm to. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. So I know we have done the chapter, but I still, uh, I mean, I know as in like theory what they mean, but I still don't understand what is actually like the call or put like, can you have like really uh, simple like ex layman examples, like what are these things actually? I know like call is buy and put is sell, but it's still really confusing. Um, well, let's see here. I'll try. But if I can't succeed here in just a couple of minutes, you need to come to my office hours. Okay. An option is the right, but not the obligation to do something. Do you get that part? And the person that buys the option, the option holder, they're the one that has the right, but not the obligation. The person who sells the obligation has to do whatever the buyer wants, and we call the seller the seller or the writer, right? Okay, now what does a call option give me the right but not the obligation to do if I buy it? It gives me the right but not the obligation to buy an asset at a given price on or before a certain date. Now, when would I want to do that? If that asset is worth more, then the exercise price, and I can buy it for the exercise price, then I've got this much profit. Yeah. But if the asset's actually worth less than that exercise price, I just walk away and all I lose is the premium that I paid for that option. That's a call option. Now what about a put option? A put option gives the buyer or holder the right but not the obligation to force the other party the seller or writer to buy the assets on or before a given date at a certain amount. That's the exercise price. Now, if the value of the asset is higher than that exercise price, it makes no sense to exercise the option to force these people to buy at this price because I could just sell it out here on the market for this price. But what if the value is actually lower? then it makes all the sense in the world for me to force these poor people to buy that asset for this value. And then, you know, if I, if I were doing this naked, I could go out and buy it for the lower value. Either way, my profit is this amount in between. Does that help you? Okay, very good. Sometimes you just have to hear things twice, right? Yeah. Okay. Other questions before we move on? Okay, so now let's talk about options and capital budgeting. What's the rule for NPV analysis? What projects do we accept? Positive. Yeah, positive NPV projects. But in the world of thinking about options, that there may be more to it than just the straight up NPV that we look at. So if a project also gives you the option to do another project down the road, then uh, there is a positive option value that we need to add on top of that NPV. So a project in and of itself might be a negative NPV project, but by the time you add the call value option of what it would allow us to do down the road, it turns into a positive NPV project. And once again, when we start looking, when we, uh, okay, so let's talk about, well, we'll discuss this and then we'll get to the other one because I, I, I jumped ahead here. So what about a highly levered company? And we've got a slightly negative NPV project our rule would tell us to reject it. But what if that project was really risky? I mean like crazy risky. If we take on that project, 
what does it do to the riskiness of the underlying assets of the firm? Increase. Yeah, it's going to increase it. And we know that an increase in the riskiness is going to increase this vol ve option value of the levered equity. We know that. Now, what does that mean? It means that occasionally you might see managers taking on negative NPV projects because they're extraordinarily risky and that riskiness will be enough to increase the option value of the, uh, of the shares, right? Because it's levered. Now, how does that work? Let's say that I am at wit's end. I'm a banker. Now, this happens in uh, any time we see these banking uh, problems like we've had recently. The, the uh, managers realize that they're getting close to the end. And the only thing that's going to save them is some big risky bet. When a risky bet pays off, is a payoff higher or lower than a safe bet? Yeah, it's higher, right? Now, what does this mean? You think about, uh, you, there you are sitting with your colleagues and you're seeing that the company is going to crash and burn. Some, and we actually see this. Um, you guys know FedEx? The, okay, so the, when that company was just getting started, the company was about to die. And the guy that was the founder actually took a briefcase full of money out to Las Vegas and gambled. Now, why did he do that? He knew he had nothing to lose. The, the company was going to be bankrupt in a week or two anyway, right? He went out there and took a risky gamble. And Mr. Ali, what happened? He got money from that. I, yeah, we just hear about the story all the time. Yeah, and, and so he does this. Now, does it have to be taking a suitcase full of money on an airplane? Absolutely not. In fact, most of the time, it's not. Most of the time, it's taking on a risky project. For instance, if you're a banker, it would be loaning money to a very risky borrower. And of course, you're going to demand a high interest rate for that. And if it works out, then you're going to be doing pretty well. And it might be enough to save the firm. Uh, in the meantime, when you, as soon as you take that risky bet, the riskiness of your underlying assets have gone up. What's happened to the option value of your levered equity? It's gone up, right? OK. So that is when it's possible that that's one of the reasons it's possible that you might accept a negative NPV project when thinking in terms of the option framework. And then we have the investment in Rio projects. This is where I was getting ready to head. So classic MPV uh, calculations typically ignore the flexibility that doing a project gives to you. And so here are some of the examples that we usually use. Uh, these films that are uh, what they call sequels, where you end up with a series of these things. Doing the very first one gives you the option to do the second one. So let's see, let's talk about Fast and Furious. How many of those films has there been? Ten? Oh, damn. Okay, now let's assume that the very first one, Fast and Furious 1, wasn't all that successful. Let's assume that it turned out to be a negative NPV project just in and of itself. What did it give the studio the right but not the obligation to do? Make a sequel. Yeah, make Fast and Furious 2 and so forth. And so each one of these movies, in addition to just the NPV analysis of the movie by itself, it also gives us options to do these sequels. Uh, another one I can think of is the Toyota Prius. You guys probably aren't even old enough to remember the original Prius. It was an ugly piece of crap. It was so ugly, and it was basically just an experimental test bed that they loosed on the public. In and of itself, the Prius, the first generation, not a positive NPV project, but what did it give them the option to do? 
the second generation. And by the way, the second generation was a positive NPV project. And so you, if you were a short, narrow-minded Toyota executive, when the engineers bring you the design for the original Prius, you'd say, whoa, it's a piece of crap, and besides that, it's ugly. And you would just turn it down. But fortunately, the people making the decisions recognized that this was just the first step. By the way, do you think Prius is still profitable for Toyota? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can't swing a dead cat without hitting a Prius around here. Um, but yeah, they sold a lot of them. Also, um, you know, you think about the original iPhone. The original iPhone was a positive NPV project in and of itself, but it also gave them the option to do other things. For example, the Apple Watch. The Apple Watch was an option that was made possible by the iPhone. Questions? Okay. <clears throat> That is the end of chapter 17. So let's, let's uh, do a little review here, and then we'll get into examples. Uh, first of all, who has the right but not the obligation, the buyer or the seller of the option? The buyer. What is the name of the thing that the buyer pays to the seller in order to get the option? The premium. The premium. Very good. Now. Um, we know that increasing volatility does what to the option value? Increases. Increases it. Is that true for both calls and puts? Yes, absolutely. Um, what does the increase in an exercise price do to the value of a call option? The va the, the, so if the exercise price is higher then yeah it makes it go down what about if the exercise price of a put option is higher then it makes it go up right and so uh, just to go back and look at that slide with the pluses and the minuses and make sure it's on your note sheet okay uh, put call parity we've got the uh, P sub zero what does that stand for <laughs> no. Yeah, it's the put value at time zero. What about C sub zero? The call premium, right? The call amount of value. What about S sub zero? Yeah, there you go, stock price. And now, what about E? Exercise. Yeah, exercise price. And remember that everything in the put call parity formula, they all have to have the same expiry, they all have to have the same exercise price, and it all has to have the same, let's see, exercise price and expiry, I think that's it. Um, that all has to be the same. Now, we said that there were two ways to calculate um, that formula. One has E divided by 1 plus R to the T. The other one has e times little e to the negative rt. For purposes of a multiple choice exam, does it matter one bit which one of those you do? Absolutely not, because the answers are going to be just pennies apart. And if you're not doing the practice where you have to type in the number, then you're good to go. So if I just have one of those in my note sheet, I'll be good. Yeah, and you know which, which one would you, should you put on there? The first one? Yeah, yeah, the easy one. How many of you know how to use that little E thing? No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so is diversification a good rationale for a merger? No. no. Give me two reasons. Number one. It only is good for the managers and not really the shareholders. Oh, yeah. So let's talk about that. The managers, why are they interested in doing this? because they can't diversify their own portfolio. So what do they do? Diversify the company. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, we know it's good for the managers, um, but we know that, uh, so it's not maximizing shareholder value either from an options framework or from a transactions cost framework. Because if you think of my transactions cost as a shareholder, I can go out and buy a bunch of different stocks and diversify my own portfolio a whole lot more cheaply and easily than those managers can. Does that make sense? 
Okay. So, um, sometimes a project might have a slight negative NPV. There are two options reasons why we might pursue it anyway. What's number one? More risk, more return. Say again? More risk, so more return. Yeah, more so return. more risk, I can take on a riskier project that's going to raise the risk of the underlying assets um, and that's going to raise the call value or the equity call value, right? So it's going to increase the value of that. Um, let's see. What are, what's the other reason that you might, uh, through an options framework, take a slightly negative pro negative MPV project? It could open up the gates for other projects. Yeah, it could open up the gates to do other things. So, you know, we could think back to buying the uh, buying Charmin. Procter & Gamble bought Charmin. We called that a strategic um, advantage or something like that. Uh, it gave them the option to do those other things. Buying Charmin in and of itself might have been a negative NPV acquisition, but it allowed them to do bounty paper towels and to do Pampers disposable diapers and all sorts of feminine hygiene products. And so it really just opened up these big options down the road. Questions? Okay, so let's talk about what you want to see examples wise. And so we've got chapter 12, 7. 8, 21, and 17. And for each of those, we have the practice, the homework, and the exam practice. to go first. None of Chapter you brought. Eight, practice two. Chapter eight, practice number two. Like that? Okay. What else? Three. Oh, on uh, chapter eight? And then 22. And, and 22 also? Okay. Other ones? Yeah, 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 And chapter eight practice. Number two, down under Boomerang is considering a three year expansion project that requires an initial fixed asset investment of $2.76 million. The fixed asset will be distributed, the depreciated straight line to zero over its three year tax life. The project is going to estimate 2.1 million in annual sales with cost of 795,000. The project requires an initial investment in networking capital of 320,000. And the fixed asset will have a market value of 220,000 at the end of the project. Okay, now what I want, first thing I want you to see is that we have basically three different cash flow levels here. We've got our time zero. We've got time one and two, but they're going to be the same. And then we've got time three. Now, for operating cash flow, there's not going to be any at time zero. But it will be the same for time one and two and for three. Are you with me so far? Now, the other thing that we have, uh, so we have two more things. We've got net capital spending, and that's going to be different for all three of these. We're going to have an outflow here. We're going to have basically nothing going on here. And then we're going to have our after-tax salvage value negative over here. 
And then we're going to add the change in networking capital. That's going to be uh, something here and then the opposite of that thing over here because when you add all that together, it has to equal zero because we're getting back to zero at the end of the project. When I do this, I'm going to take OCF minus NCS minus the change in the networking capital. What's that going to give me? CFFA, cash flow from assets. Okay, so let's start working through this. I'm going to leave OCF for last. What does it tell us about the change in networking capital? 320,000. 320,000. So um, it's going to be positive 320,000 here. What's going to be, what's going to happen times 1 to 2? Um, it's going to Nothing, right? <laughs> what's going to happen at time 3? Um, zero. We have to get to like, uh, zero value, I think. Yeah, we have to have a change that's going to bring us back to zero. Yeah, so with the like opposite sign. Yeah, so now all we have is minus $320,000. Okay, so we've got one of our lines taken care of there. Okay, now let's talk about the net capital spending. What's our net capital spending going to be in year zero? Yeah, how much is it? Yeah, it's probably different numbers than whatever you've got. Okay. So, and then what's going to happen in years one to two? Wait, where did we get that number from? It says that the initial fixed investment is two point seven six million dollars. Okay. Okay. Where to next? What's going to happen? Oh, so what's going to happen in years one and two? Yeah, nothing's going to happen, right? Now, it doesn't have to be. You can have stuff going on here and here, but for purposes of the exam, you probably won't see that, right? You probably won't see that. Ms. Roll, you look a little surprised. Were you expecting for me to throw that at you? Like she was hoping for something other than probably. She was hoping for certainty. <laughs> there is no certainty in this life. We could all walk out of here today and just, you know, fall over dead. Okay. So what's over here? Okay, you're getting close. What's ATSV stand for? After tax salvage value, and it is equal to the market value minus the tax rate times the market value, or yeah, minus the book value. Okay, they tell us that we can sell this thing for how much at the end? 220,000. Minus, what's the tax rate? 22%. How much? 22%. 22%. Boy, that's a low tax rate. <coughs> Times market value of 220000 What's the book value at the end? Zero. How do we know? Because it says that we're straight line depreciating this thing to zero. zero. Okay. Can someone do this math? By the way, it's going to be the same as 220,000 times 0.78, if that helps. How much? 163,000. Can someone confirm that number? 963,000. I'm sorry, 163,900. Oh, you're just checking. 163,900. I got a different number. Uh-oh. I got 171,600. Okay. Yeah, what did you get? What did you get? I think you are out of it. I get 4.83. What? <laughs> oh, oh, it's so painful. Is that it? Are we all in agreement now? Yeah. By the way, if I take 0.78 times this thing that ends in a 2, I should expect to get a 6 over here somewhere, right? Okay. So, here's the thing though, net capital spending is positive when the money's going out. 
This is money coming in. So what do we have to do? Yeah, it's going to be minus 176,000 bucks. So far, so good. The only thing I have left to do here is to find OCF. Is that supposed to be 171? Yeah, 171. 600? Oh, shit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Your number's filled in. Ah. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. When you guys were in grade school, did the teacher ever make you come to the board and work out problems somewhere in the class? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how'd that work out? Not too well. Not as well as sitting there with your own pencil and paper, right? <laughs> okay, now, uh, let's see. I'll bet the Americans haven't even done that. Americans, any of you forced to go to the board? Oh, yeah. Damn, that's amazing. I'm pleased to hear that. Okay, back to the story. OCF. Uh, what <coughs> kinds of, bless you. Um, what is the annual sales generated by this thing? Uh, 2.1. Okay, so is this the number? Okay, and then they tell us it's going to increase our cost by 795000 And then we've got to subtract out something else. What is it? Depreciation. Now, how am I going to find out my depreciation? They told us we're going to take this $2,760,000 and we're going to straight line depreciate it over how many years? Three. What is 2.76 million divided by 3? Should be something slightly less than a million. 920,000. Yeah. 920,000 bucks. Okay, so then we're going to subtract 920,000 bucks. And that will give us our pre-tax income, or EBIT, since there's no interest involved in, a, in these projects. Can someone tell me what that number is? $385,000. 385000 Can anyone confirm that number? Mm -hmm. She there. is correct. Sweet. Okay. Now, we need to subtract out the taxes. How much are the taxes? It's going to be 22% of 385000 So here's what I can actually do. I can just say 385000 times 1 minus 0.22, and that's going to give me how much? So it's 0.78. 385,000 times 0.78. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. 300,000. How do I get from this to OCF? Add the deposition back. Yeah, so OCF, OCF, OCF is equal to EBIT plus uh, depreciation minus taxes. But this number we've got already is EBIT minus tax, so we just need to add back the depreciation. Does that make sense? So what we're really doing here is 300,300 plus 920,000. I'm thinking that is 1,222,300. Is that right? No. No? 1,321. Oh, yeah, sorry. 1,220. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. 1,220,300. Is that look right? Okay, so that's our OCF. Two two oh three oh oh one two two oh three oh oh. Okay, now let's make sure that they're. Oh yeah, we're we're fine. Okay, so now we're going to add these things. We're going to do this minus this minus this. So this minus this minus this. I'm thinking is negative three million zero eight oh 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 oh. Is that right? Okay, and then uh, this one is really easy. One two two o oh, three o oh, o. Oh. What's this one? So 
728700. Yep, 728700. 728700. You don't, don't trust us? I don't. I really don't. What? It's, it's this, this number yeah. minus minus. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Minus, minus. Oh. See why I didn't trust you? It's Finally. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, someone try again, please. 171900. 171900. One, uh -huh. one, one, 900. 900. Yeah. That makes sense. So we've got 600 plus uh, 300 is 900. And then we've got, this is 491. So 500 to 1720. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay, now, what do we do to find, let's see, it's asking us to find the uh, NPV. What do we do next? Yeah, CF second, clear work. CF second, clear work. What do I put in for CF sub zero? Three zero eight zero 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 plus minus enter. Make sure you hit enter or it's like down. a what's that? Arrow down. Arrow down, very good. What is C01? One, two, two, zero. One, two, two, zero, three, zero, zero. Enter. Arrow down. Arrow down. Now, what does it say? F zero? One. One. What number do we put in there? Two. Two. Why? Yeah, we got two years here. Okay. Enter. Arrow down. What is C02? 1711. Yeah, 1,711,900. Enter. What button do you hit next? NPV. NPV. It says I is equal to. What do I plug in there? 12%. 12. Enter. Arrow down. What do you do now? Compute. Compute. And what do you get? <coughs> Holy. 200. <laughs> And maybe because I was practicing, so it, it has, you know, yeah, still remembered some stuff. I'm okay. That's yeah, okay. CF second clear work. Yeah, I probably didn't do it properly. Uh huh. So, try it now and then go. Yeah. It's really long. <laughs> I get it though. I just want to make sure you know how to clear your calculator. Yeah, it's CF second clear work. Okay. CF. Oh, sorry. Come mind. Okay, CF, CF second. second clear work. Now. Go back and tell me what does C what does C of zero say right now? Zero. Woo, you're good. <laughs> tell that wasn't that long. And now you feel better, right? I feel. I know I feel better. So in the exam, like we will be given these cash flows of directly, or we will have to do this all, like all the questions. Oh, okay. So uh, keep in mind that when I write an exam, it's my intention to write an exam that there will be some questions that everybody gets right, right? And then there will be some questions that only C, B, and A students get right. And then there will be some questions that only B and A students get right. And then there will be some questions that only A students get right. Question like this will be mostly, most likely the one that only A students would get right. Now what does that mean percentage wise? Remember there's four calculations per chapter. chapter, right? So out of all those calculations, how many of them would probably be this intense? Like yeah. And so if you really, you look at it and you're like, right? What do you do? Skip. Skip it, right? Does that make sense? Now back in the old days when you had to fill in the little circles on the Scantron, it was a problem because if you skipped it, but you didn't skip the number on your sheet, you'd be off by one, and then you'd look like yeah, you had some sort of brain injury, right? But the, the good news is the way we do it now, you don't need to worry about that. Other questions? Oh, oh, crap. Phew, at least it didn't sign me out of uh, Connect. Okay, the next one. Your firm is contemplating the purchase of a new $540,000 computer-based order entry system. The system will be depreciated straight line to zero over its five-year life. It'll be worth fifty-two thousand. At the end of that time, you're going to save three hundred thousand before taxes per year in order of processing costs. You will be able to reduce working capital by sixty thousand dollars. This is sixty-seven. That's a one-time reduction. If your tax rate is twenty-three percent, what's the IRR for this project? Okay, so I'm just going to erase these numbers. We're going to be doing something very similar here. Crap. 
Okay, now, what's going on up here? What's this middle column going to be? One, two, one to three. Four. One to four, sorry. And what's the last one? Five. Very good. Okay, so um, let's see what they tell us. A $540,000 computer based order entry system. What is that? Where should I put that? Yeah, in a cabinet. So I'm going to put that right here. 540000 bucks. Okay, now um, the system will be depreciated straight line to zero over its five year life. I think 540000 uh, divided by five is 108,000. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, the system will be it will be worth 52,000 at the end of that time. What's the tax rate? 23%. 0 0.23 times market value 52,000. We're depreciating the zero. What's the book value? Zero. zero. What is 52,000 times 0.77? How much? 40. So like this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, where does that number go? Yeah. How about right here? Well, what do I have to do? Negative. Yeah, it's got to be negative because that's money coming back to us, right? And so money coming back to us is negative spending. Okay. Whew. Then they tell, what do they tell us about the networking capital? Um, 67,000. Yeah, but is it an increase or a decrease? Yeah. <laughs> it's a decrease. And so it's actually minus 67,000 over here. Now, in order to get this line to total up to zero. 67. Yeah, I've got to do a positive 67,000 over here. That is the biggest thing that trips people up about this problem, is this unusual pattern for what's going on with networking capital, because it goes down in the beginning and comes up at the end. That's the biggest problem for this problem. Okay, I add all that stuff together, CFFA. I can already do this part. Uh, so zero minus 540,000 is negative 540,000 plus 67,000. Can someone tell me what that would be? Negative 473. Say again? Negative 473,000. Negative 473,000. Does anyone else get that? Yeah, that looks right to me too. Okay. And so now the only thing that's left for us to get is this OCF. So they tell us that it's going to save 300,000 in order processing costs. So 300,000 is our basically our revenue from this project. It's money that we're not having to spend, so that's positive 300,000. Um, you'll be able to reduce work capital. We're told that now. Um, what do I need to subtract out of this, though, before I figure my taxes? Depreciation. Yeah, the depreciation. And like we said earlier, it was 108000 I think this is 192000 Is that correct? Okay. Now, what is 192000 uh, times, let's go ahead and do it the old-fashioned way here. What's 192000 times 0.23? 44 160. Okay, so go ahead and subtract that out and tell me what we get here at the end. Actually, I don't even have to do that, do I? I can just say 192,000 plus 108,000 minus 44,160. So basically, it's just 300,000 minus 44,160. How much is that? 55,840. 255840. Does everyone agree on that number? Okay, so 255840. Same number here. Okay, so this number is really easy. What about over here? 
I've got this minus minus, so I've got to add that. So I think that is 295,880. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So what is 295,880 minus 67,000? 228,880. That sounds right to me. Do you guys get that too? Mm -hmm. oh, Ms. Minahan looks suspicious. Oh, I just, I, I mean, I got to an 8840, eight, 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 but I forgot what 40,000 Oh, uh, okay. I just have 40,000. Okay. So are you, with, are you with us now? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Now, how are we going to put this into our calculator? Ms. Roll, what's the very first thing we should do? CF second clear work. Very good. CF second clear work. What do I put in for CF zero? Negative four, two, yeah. or seven. I'm looking two. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, negative four, seven. 473,000 plus minus. Okay. And then hit what? What do you have to hit after you hit the plus minus key? Enter. Enter. Now, what's next? CO1. Oh, arrow down, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, right, arrow down. C01, what do I put in for C01? 255. 255. 840. 840. Enter. Arrow down. What do I put in for F01? Four. Four, because I have four years of this. Enter. Arrow down. What do I put in for C02? 228. 228880. Enter. Now, it's asking us for the IRR. This is a tricky question. What button do I hit next? IRR. IRR. And it's going to say IRR is equal to zero. Is that right? Mm -hmm. No. What do you got to do? Compute. Compute, right? And when you compute, what do you get? 45.35. Woohoo! 45.35. Okay, the biggest difference in this one was how this change in networking capital happened. It's, it went down to begin with and came back up at the end. Don't let that freak you out. Questions? Where did the one away come from? Um, it's 540,000 divided by the five year life because we're straight line depreciating to zero. Cool, cool. Could you scroll and point out where it said we're like networking capital's going out again? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because it normally goes in. Yeah, so it says uh, at the beginning you'll be able to reduce the working capital by 67,000. So reduce means negative, and so the change in networking capital here would be negative 67,000. We know we've got to add it back at the end in order to get back to zero. But then, of course, we've got the, when we do the CFFA, there's a negative in front of that delta NWC. Other questions? So. I missed the calculation. So we just calculated IR directly after the cash flows. Say again? So we just press IR directly after the cash flows. Yeah, and then what do you have? Compute. Yeah. Have you done it? Yeah, I did, but I thought I, I it might not be right, so I just asked. Okay. Did you get 45.35? Yeah. Sweet. By the way, do I care how you get to the number as long as you're not cheating? No. No. And so even if that 45.35 showed up by magic? Apparently, you've got the right magic, right? Okay, now, let's see here. We have, oh, what was that? I erased it. What was the other one? Um, 22. 22. The initial cost of the machine is $727,000 with operating costs of $39,600. Each machine has a life of five years before it is replaced. Ignore taxes. What is the equivalent annual cost of this machine if the required return is 16%? Okay, so we've got time zero. How much are we spending on the machine? 727. Yeah, 727,000. Now keep in mind that these cash flows are all in the same direction. It's all money out of our pocket, right? And so if you wanted to, you could put negatives on all of them, but I always screw up when I do that, so I try to leave them as positives. Okay, now, then it has a life of five years before it's replaced. So years one through five, oh, by the way, does it mention anything about a salvage value? 
No. If it did, I would have had one through four up there. Does that make sense? Because we have to do something different for time five. But we don't. Okay. So then uh, annual operating cost of 39600 Where are we going to go first? CF. On the calculator. CF? Second. Second. Clear work. Very good. Now, what do I put in for seven or for time zero? 727,000. 727, do I put a negative sign on it? No. no. Okay. Enter. Arrow down. What do I put in for C01? 39,600. 39,600. Enter. Arrow down. What is F01? Five. Five. Enter. Now, what do I do next? I don't know. Oh, NPV. There you go, NPV. NPV. Remember what we're doing is we're going to scratch all this into a single value at time zero, and then we're going to expand it back out. Okay, so if I hit NPV, now the next thing it's going to ask me is I. What do I put in for I? 16. 16. Enter. Arrow down. Compute. What do you get? 856.66. So that's uh. 662, yeah, sorry. Okay, so you guys all have the same number? <laughs> Store one. Just in case everything goes horribly, horribly wrong, store one. Okay, now I want you to hit the clear button twice and see what happens. Is the number still hanging out there? Yeah. Okay, now I want you to do second clear TVM, second clear TVM. And the reason we're doing that is because we're going to put this thing in as the present value. So hit PV. What should I put in for N? Five. five. And this would be five regardless of whether we had a salvage value or not because this is the life of the machine. So five uh, N, what do I put in for I per Y? 16, 16 I per Y. And what do I compute? to get the equivalent annual cost. Payment. Payment. Compute PMT and tell me what you get. Yeah. 261.632.62. Very good. Does that answer your question? I hope you bring this one. <laughs> you like that one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now let me, let me throw another one at you, a different wording. In fact, you may have already seen this in your exam practice. Sometimes they'll say, and the OCF for years one through five is negative 39,600. What the heck does that mean? The same thing as this. Yeah, so the negative OCF for those years, don't worry about it. So why are all of these numbers positive? Like, in the last, like when we did those, the first number Okay, so when we're doing stuff like this, we're making an investment, which is money out, and we're getting money positive cash flows back for return, right? But when we're looking at equivalent annual cost, it's all yeah, everything we're looking at is a cost. And to make it easier, I always just do them all positive. Because otherwise, if you do them all negative, here's what you gotta do. You gotta remember when you enter this thing to make it negative, you gotta remember when you enter this thing to make it negative, and are they always this pretty and sweet? No, you may have to do more stuff out here. Oh yeah, you gotta be careful. Other questions? Is it gonna hurt your feelings for me to let you go five minutes early? Okay, next time, please have your list of questions ready. Thank you, Ms. Rafael. We would not have had anything to talk about today had it not been for you. <laughs>